Volcanic activity is among the most awe-inspiring and terrifying processes on the Earth's surface. It replenishes the land, but sometimes at the cost of life. It also creates the largest landforms in the solar system. But even those huge features start as the result of something small. Those small events are determined primarily by the viscosity of magma. You may have only heard of viscosity in relation to oil, but it applies to any liquid and is simply a measure of the resistance to flow. Water flows more easily than ketchup, so water has a lower viscosity. But how does viscosity of magma relate to something on a different scale, like the size and shape of volcanoes? The connection is how the volcanic eruption happens. Is it calm or is it violent? So the next question is which viscosity, high or low, causes violent eruptions? We can go back to my comparison between water and ketchup. You have probably boiled water before. Small bubbles come to the surface and they pop with minimal splash. Try the same thing with ketchup. Larger bubbles will come to the surface and spray red across your ceiling. Magma with higher viscosity will result in more violent eruptions. Now we can look more closely at magma to see what determines its viscosity. The second bullet is probably obvious to you. As magma decreases in temperature, crystals start to form and viscosity increases. Similarly, as the amount of gas in the magma decreases, the viscosity increases. However, the most important factor for most magmas is the amount of silica. Higher silica content, as in felsic magmas, are more viscous. So content at the atomic level determines viscosity, which determines the type of eruption, which determines the size and shape of volcanoes. Most lavas come from deep within the earth and as a result have a mafic composition. The two most commonly seen erupting on land are Pohoihoi and A'a. Both are terms with a Hawaiian origin because that's where they are commonly studied. Pohoihoi is the hotter of the two, which gives it a lower viscosity. That allows it to run, into she run in sheets or form a braided texture. A'a is cooler, and as the magma cools, gas escapes. This forms vesicles which have sharp edges. A'a is what you would say if you walked across the surface of it. Now, both of these magmas are well studied because mafic magmas normally have mild eruptions. You can simply walk away from them. The third major type of mafic lava is pillow lava. These form exclusively underwater, most commonly along the virgin plate boundaries. Lava erupts underwater and the outer shell quickly solidifies. However, because the lava below continues to move up, that outer shell is cracked and another blob is formed on top or off to the side. Explosive eruptions from viscous magmas will form fragments of rock. Because felsic magmas are always viscous, this is how they will form at the Earth's surface. However, mafic magmas can also be viscous if they are relatively cool and have low gas content. So these same terms sometimes also apply to mafic rocks. The difference between these is just the, it's just the size of the particles. Now that we've looked at the building blocks, let's look at the final product, a volcano. The primary opening at the top of a volcano is the crater, or a caldera, depending on the size. While this limit of one kilometer seems arbitrary, in reality, craters tend to be much smaller and calderas much larger. This is largely because of how calderas form. During an eruption, there is ash being spewed up into the air and volcanic bombs cooling in the air as they rain down along the sides of the volcano. Once the material has left the magma chamber and the conduits to the surface, 
there is no longer support for the rock above. After the rock collapses into that empty space, the resulting depression on the surface is the new caldera. The crater or caldera is the primary opening from a volcano, but it is only one type of vent. Vents refer to any openings and can include smaller parasitic cones along the sides of volcanoes and fumaroles, which emit gases but no lava. Your book mentions the three main types of volcanoes, and this image shows a fourth, less common one called a dome complex and you will need to know what a dome complex is. Shield volcanoes form from the repeated eruption of hot mafic magmas. Because of its low viscosity, the lava spreads out thinly over a very large area. Cinder cone volcanoes are also made of mafic lava, but it's lava that has a much lower temperature and has lost much of, its, much of its gas content. As a result, it has a high viscosity resulting in explosive eruptions. Materials are shot up and fall right back down. Composite volcanoes have a combination of lava types. The runny lavas allow it to grow large across although not as wide as shield volcanoes, and the viscous lavas allow the sides to become steep, although not as steep as cinder cone volcanoes. Dome complexes are usually made of felsic material, are at low temperature, and have lost most of its gas. For all three of these reasons, the lava is very viscous. In many cases, the viscosity is even too great for an eruption to occur. Instead, the volcano grows from within, causing a landform that almost seems organic as it grows and shrinks. But because of the very high viscosity, if a dome complex does erupt, it does so violently, devastating the immediate area. Apart from a couple of volcanoes in Hawaii, most people would only recognize the names of composite volcanoes, like Mount Etna, Mount Fuji, Mount Vesuvius. Mount St. Helens, shown here, also falls into this category. The 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens blew off a section of the mountain about a mile wide. This photo is not from the exact angle as the previous one, but you can still see the lake in the foreground. In the middle of the caldera, you can see a smoking gray bump. It's the beginning of a dome complex. Basically, a new volcano is being born. Now, the animations a couple minutes ago were scaled to fit the entire volcano to the screen. So I wanted to be sure everyone realized the true size and shape comparisons. Shield volcanoes at the top are by far the largest both in area and in height. We can even see shield volcanoes on some other planets. Cinder cone volcanoes on the bottom right are by far the shortest, but they also have the steepest sides. Composite volcanoes are intermediate in height, in width, and in steepness. When Mount St. Helens blew, it was not magma that did much of the damage, but instead ash, lahars, and a nuée ardente. Nuée ardentes are superheated masses of gas, ash, and rock that move quickly and take out everything in the way. The example of Saint-Pierre on the island of Martinique being devastated by Mount Pelée is a particularly, particularly disturbing one. For 200 years, the citizens of St. Pierre had become accustomed to the rumblings, the smoking, and the rare minor eruptions of Mount Pelée. However, in 1900, the shaking began to get more extreme. It attracted 
geologists from around the world, who for the most part stay on ships out in the harbor. They were there to watch what they thought would be a huge eruption, not to become part of that huge eruption. On May 8, 1902, they saw it. Almost immediately after the eruption, a Nue Ardent wiped out St. Pierre, its 28,000 citizens, and thousands of others who had come in from the countryside for shelter. This Nui Ardant was much more intense than the typical one described in your textbook. This one at St. Pierre was moving at more than 400 miles per hour and at temperatures that may have been as much as 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's too fast to outrun. And with your very first breath, you would burn to death from the inside. There are many legends about who survived the Nui Ardant. Certainly one person did. A guy who got drunk and started a fight was placed in this jail at the edge of town, and that shelter saved him. There are also stories about a little girl who made it to a boat to get out to sea, and a handful of others who survived the initial blast but, dies, but died days later. Plus, there were certainly people just outside of town who watched the Nui Ardant and lived. Well, at least they lived for a little while. About two weeks after the main blast, there was, an, a, second, there was a second eruption. Unfortunately, this time, those geologists who were on the ships were on shore, examining the wreckage, and there were aid workers on shore helping the survivors. An additional 2,000 people perished. A lahar is sometimes classified as a special type of pyroclastic flow. It is water mixed with ash. This mixture has a density that gives it much more strength than a normal flood. Plus, it doesn't have to happen at the same time as a volcanic eruption. Ash can accumulate in an area and years, decades, centuries later can become saturated with water and become initiated. After the eruptions are over and the hazards have abated, volcanic activity leaves a number of different objects on and under the ground. The rocks cooled underground, the plutons, are named based on their shape and orientation. Shape refers to whether they are tabular, which is thin and sheet-like, or massive. Orientation refers to whether the pluton cuts across neighboring rocks, which is discordant, or sits parallel to the other rocks, making it concordant. Now in this example, we see lava rising and moving in many directions. It's parallel to some rocks and cutting across others. Sometimes it makes it to the surface and sometimes it doesn't. Once the magma cools, plutons are formed. Erosion can then help make these features more visible at the surface. This is especially true for uh, unique features like volcanic nets, which is the rock that cooled within the lava conduit to a volcano's crater. With enough erosion, the large rock formed within the magma chamber can be revealed. This is the feature that we refer to as an exfoliation dome in the chapter on weathering. Your book names and describes the types of plutons over several pages, but I think it's more useful to pull all those terms together. This would be something good for you to copy down for your quiz. If a pluton is tabular, it is a dike or a sill. The difference between them is the, their orientation. Lacoliths differ from stocks and bats also by orientation. Stocks and batholiths differ from each other only in size. So in this lecture we covered volcanic activity and we previously talked about plate tectonics. So let's put those two together and talk about where we see volcanic activity and in what kind of plate tectonic setting. If you have two pieces of oceanic, uh, two pieces of oceanic lithospheric plates coming together, the older one is subducted, pushed down, and melted. That magma comes up to the surface and forms a volcano, 
within the ocean. Now in this case, in South America, we have South America moving to the east, moving away from the plate that's immediately to the west. However, that plate to the west is also moving east and it's moving even faster. Therefore, it's overtaking the South American plate. It's being forced down because it's oceanic crust instead of continental crust. And it's forming volcanoes along the edge of the continent. So those first two examples were uh, conversion plate boundaries. We also have extensive volcanic activity along divergent plate boundaries. Here in the middle of the ocean along Iceland, we have volcanic activity. And then in this budding new divergent plate boundary in East Africa, we also have volcanoes. There are a few places where you have volcanic activity not associated with the plate boundary. In the case of Hawaii, there's no boundary whatsoever, but instead those islands are situated above a mantle plume, which provides a source of, a source of material. Now along some boundaries, you simply do not have volcanic activity. We've mentioned before that in Southern California, you can have a volcano. You have transformed boundaries in Southern California and Northern Mexico, so there's no vol volcanism there. You do have volcanism farther to the north and to the south because, of, because those are different kinds of plate boundaries. Here is another plate boundary. It's a convergent boundary. But unlike the other two convergent boundaries we looked at, here you have two continental plates coming together. In that case, neither one is being subducted. They're both being pushed up, which means you have no volcanic activity. So I'll let you figure this one out. What is happening at the area enclosed in red? 